Imagine you were so good at hockey that someone offered you a hundred million dollars to play it and after a couple years you were like, nah, I'm good. We don't all get to live that life, but not all of us are really a Kovalchuk. Hey, I'm Steve Dangle and this is a trade tree video where we look at the history of how a trade evolved over the years and today's is going to be Ilya Kovalchuk going from the Atlanta Thrashers, or the Winnipeg Jets, depends who you ask, to the New Jersey Devils. Back in 2001, Ilya Kovalchuk was considered a very good hockey player, so good in fact that he was drafted first overall. Unfortunately, the team to pick him was the Atlanta Thrashers, and they were really bad for a really long time. But Kovalchuk, he didn't have that problem. As a rookie, he had 29 goals, 22 assists for 51 points in just 65 games. As a sophomore, he had 67 points, 38 of which were goals. The next season, he scored 41 goals, which was enough to earn him the Maurice Rocket Richard Trophy. But here's the thing, the 41 goals that he scored to win the Rocket, that was actually the fifth highest goal total of Kovalchuk's career. Actually, he was tied for fifth. From 0304 to 0910, Kovalchuk hit at least 40 goals for six straight seasons. He was a dynamo. But the Thrashers were the Thrashers. The Thrashers made the playoffs just once the entire time Ilya Kovalchuk was there, and Sean Avery just followed him around like his annoying shadow the whole time. Finally, on February 4th, 2010, the Thrashers opted for the rebuild and made a deal with the Devils. And as you can see, yeah, it's kind of a big trade tree. To be exact, the New Jersey Devils acquired a second round pick in 2010, defenseman Nancy Salamala, and Ilya Kovalchuk. The Atlanta Thrashers acquired defenseman Johnny Oduya, forward prospect Patrice Cormier, forward prospect Nicholas Bergforce, a 2010 first round pick, and a 2010 second round pick. Now let's look at how this trade affected the Atlanta Thrashers and therefore the Winnipeg Jets as well as the entire NHL for years to come. At first glance, what the Thrashers get is great. In terms of immediate roster help, you get Johnny Oduya, who's a rising defenseman in the NHL at the time. You have Nicholas Bergforce, who as a rookie that was the season that the trade happened, had 13 goals and 27 points in 54 games. Coming through the system, you have Patrice Cormier, who was a former second round pick, a recent second round pick in 2008, and a recent captain of Canada's World Junior Team. You also get a second round pick in 2010, although you gave up a second round pick in the trade too. The second round pick the Thrashers gave up was 38th overall, the one that they got was 54th, so they basically moved down in the 2010 second round. But they also get a 2010 first that was 24th overall. That's a pretty good package of futures. But the problem with the Atlanta Thrashers from the moment they joined the NHL is that if you don't chase the future properly, you'll always be chasing it. After a couple seasons with Atlanta and one with the Jets, Johnny Oduya was traded to the Chicago Blackhawks in exchange for a second round pick in 2013 and a third round pick in 2013. Again, that trade looks fine. You just gotta use it properly. But what they do with those picks. The Jets use that 2013 third rounder to select JC LePont. Again, world junior credentials. He looks like he's gonna be great never really broke out. He's still in the AHL, where he has had at least 100 penalty minutes in each of his first seven AHL seasons, except for that one time in 15-16 where he got called up by the Jets for nine games. Don't you hate when that happens? The 2013 second that they got also traded. This pick went to the Washington Capitals in exchange for a third round pick, a fourth round pick, and a fifth round pick. It's an increasingly popular thought process throughout hockey that after like the top 10 or 15 picks of the first round, the draft is pretty even. So the more picks you can get, the better, even if it means trading down. To get three picks for one is pretty good. But again, what do you do with them? The Washington Capitals used that pick to select Zach Sanford, who ended up winning the Stanley Cup with the St. Louis Blues last year and had a career high 30 points. The Jets, on the other hand, get Jimmy Lodge, Jan Kostelik, and Tucker Poolman. Lodge split last season between the ECHL and the Slovak League, and Kostelik played in the Czech League last season. Tucker Poolman was the only one with a regular roster spot on the Jets this past season in 57 games. So it took over half a decade for the Jets to get benefit out of the Johnny Oduya trade regularly in their lineup. Late's better than never for sure, but half a dozen years is tough. And what the Jets got for Johnny Oduya is better than what they got for Patrice Cormier, which is 52 regular season games followed by nothing. Big bruising guy, tough, handy to have in the minors for sure, but no lasting NHL impact. Nicholas Bergforce, former first round pick, another whiff. That amazing rookie season he was having, yeah, that was the best season of his career. And imagine how different the Jets would look today if instead of getting Bergforce, they got the next pick in that draft, which was 
TJ Oshie. After 79 games with the Thrashers, Bergfors was packaged with Patrick Rissmiller and sent to the Florida Panthers in exchange for Radic Dvorak and a fifth round pick in 2011. Dvorak played 82 games with the Atlanta Thrashers, scored 37 points, and was a Winnipeg Jet for like nine days before he hit free agency and left. In that fifth round pick they got, they packaged it with a seventh round pick and sent it to San Jose for a fourth. Which is a shame because the fourth rounder was used to select a guy who's currently in the KHL and the fifth rounder was used to select Sean Corrali. It took a while for him to come into his own, but Corrali's a good player. All right, Steve, if you don't give me some good news for the Jets, I'm gonna turn this video off. Here we are. What did I say? Sometimes if you chase the future, you might end up chasing it forever. The Winnipeg Jets decided to go after it. The Winnipeg Jets traded the first and second rounders they got from New Jersey in the Kovalchuk deal, along with Joey Crabb, Jeremy Morin, and Marty Reisner to Chicago for Akeem Aliou, Brent Sopel, Ben Eager, and a guy you might have heard of named Dustin Bufflin. This is a true story. We have a Trade Trees group chat. It's me, freelance editor Tom, and producer Drew, and we were talking about trade trees we want to do in the future. And I'm pretty sure we scheduled the Kovalchuk trade tree and the Bufflin trade tree one after the other. Until Tom did his research and discovered, uh, guys, they're the same tree. So, let's talk about it. We're going back in time. They're not the Jets anymore. They're the Atlanta Thrashers. At the time, they were chasing the future forever. The Chicago Blackhawks, on the other hand, had an immediate decision to make. They had just won the 2010 Stanley Cup, but it came at a cost. They weren't going to be able to keep the band together, and they had to trade some guys. But what was the Chicago Blackhawks? Oh, you're the reigning Stanley Cup champions, and you just have too many good players. But they did have one player in particular who was fascinating in 2010. In the 2010 Stanley Cup playoffs, Bufflin had 16 points, 11 of them goals, and maybe even more impressive than that, he bullied Chris Pronger. This was a time where in front of the net, Chris Pronger was talked about like a god and Dustin Bufflin just picked him up and tossed him around like he was Loki. So the Atlanta Thrashers slash Winnipeg Jets organization got him and were like, hey, welcome on board. You play defense now. And a lot of people said, what? That's dumb. You can't just go from playing forward to defense and expect to be good at it. And then we all sat in our very wrong wrongness. Now I'm sure you recently heard the Dustin Bufflin's days with the Winnipeg Jets are over. Man, did that guy have a good run though. Five 528 regular season games played, 102 goals, and 363 points. He was an even better playoff performer. In 17 games, when the Jets went three rounds deep a few years ago, he had 16 points. In a six-game series against the eventual Stanley Cup champion St. Louis Blues, he had eight points. And forget the points he scored, there can't be many more players around the league you would not want to be in a four to seven game war with than Dustin Bufflin. The rest of the deal, eh, not as glamorous. Ben Eager was a depth forward for the Thrashers for one year before he was traded to San Jose for a fifth rounder in 2011, who never played in the NHL. Brent Sopel, a depth defenseman with the organization, was packaged with Nigel Dawes and sent to the Montreal Canadiens for Ben Maxwell in a fourth in 2011. That fourth was then packaged with another fourth in 2011 and sent to Montreal for a third. Again, never played in the NHL. Akeem Aliou, though, I want to spend a little time on. The player Aliou was traded for never played for the Thrashers or the Jets. But Aliou in Calgary had an immediate impact. For this video, I went back and looked at the highlights from his first two NHL games with the Calgary Flames after this deal. Uh, eventful. In his first game, he had an assist in a 3-2 Calgary Flames win over the Vancouver Canucks. That's cool. First NHL point in his first NHL game, and it's a win. In his second game, he scored two goals. His first career NHL goal, which was meant to be a pass to Mike Camilleri that deflected off somebody and went in. And the second goal was like a point shot that went off his back or something and found its way to the back of the net. He had two crushing hits on Cam Fowler, and on the second one, the Ducks said enough is enough. Matt Bel Leski jumps him and he got a 10 minute misconduct and George Barrows did as well somehow because he was still playing. The highlights from that game were fun to say the least. A 5-2 win for the Flames over the Anaheim Ducks on April 7th, 2012. I digress. What do the Winnipeg Jets currently have left from the Ilya Kovalchuk deal that was made with the Atlanta Thrashers? Tucker Pullman. But I always try to stress this in these videos, that trade was 10 years ago. If you don't have any players left, that's okay. What did you get out of it during those 10 years? And the answer is, at very least, over 500 games of Dustin Bufflin being a rock in your lineup. Oh yeah, who did the uh, Devils get? Ansi Salmala, 
He played 74 games for the Devils. The second round pick that the Devils got from Atlanta, they used to select John Merrill, who played 216 games for them, and then was stolen by the Vegas Golden Knights in the expansion draft. And then there's Ilya Kovalchuk. After getting traded by the Thrashers, Kovalchuk was very productive when he arrived with the Devils. Fewer goals, but more assists. 10 goals, 17 assists for 27 points in 27 games. He had two goals and four assists for six points in the playoffs, but that was in just five games and the Devils were eliminated in the first round. The next season, Kovalchuk had 31 goals and 29 assists for 60 points in 81 games. That's good for sure, but it's not the dominance that we expect out of Kovalchuk at the time. Not helping matters, the New Jersey Devils had the eighth best goals against in the entire NHL that season. Their goals for 30th out of 30. Kind of tough to pin on Kovalchuk because the closest devil behind him was Patrick Eliage with 21. The next season, however, Pete DeBoer is behind the bench. A couple young players take a step and the devils are on their way. Kovalchuk, 37 goals, 46 assists for 83 points in 77 games. That's more like it. Just like the season before, their goals against is 8th in the entire NHL, but their goals for is 11th instead of 30th. Kovalchuk and the devils in the playoffs, even better. Through injuries at all, Kovalchuk had 8 goals and 11 assists for a team leading 19 points in 23 playoff games as the New Jersey Devils went all the way to Game 6 of the Stanley Cup Final against the LA Kings in 2012. The Devils didn't end up pulling off the miracle 3-0 series deficit comeback over the Kings, but if they had, there's a good chance Kovalchuk could have won the Conn Smythe that year. Then there's a little thing called the lockout. Once hockey comes back, Kovalchuk has 31 points in 37 games, which isn't bad, but 11 of them are goals. The Devils' goals against takes a step back, they're 15th. Their goals for, again, tanks, 28th out of 30, which leads to a perfect storm. Let's go back a bit. Summer of 2010, it's right after the Devils acquired Kovalchuk. The Devils didn't go very far in the playoffs, but they look at him and they go, we have a player. And when you score 40 or more goals in six consecutive seasons, you can ask for a lot of money. And Lou Lamorello and the New Jersey Devils, they offered him a lot of money. $102 million, which you might look at today and go, well, I mean, Connor McDavid makes 100 million and they had longer contracts back then. That is true, that is true. They did have longer contracts back then. Connor McDavid can only sign an eight year deal with the Oilers. Here's the thing though, the contract they offered Kovalchuk was more than twice as long. The New Jersey Devils offered Ilya Kovalchuk $102 million over 17 seasons. As you might know with Connor McDavid, $100 million divided by eight seasons, that is a $12.5 million cap hit. $102 million divided by 17 is six. I don't care if it was 10 years ago. The Devils tried to get a six time 40 plus goal scorer, a Rocket Richard winner, to a six million dollar cap hit. And the NHL said, uh, that's ridiculous. Had that deal gone through, he would still have seven full seasons left on that contract after this one. Some more quick math, 17 times an 82 game regular season is 1,394 games. Wow, Kovalchuk must have been going for a record or something that, or the contract was nonsense and intentionally made way longer than it needed to be to get the cap hit down, which was the problem with these long, backdiving contracts. That's exactly why they got rid of them. After the NHL said, that's ridiculous, try again, Lou Lamorello said, how about only a hundred million? So we, we took away two million over 15 years, which is still a 6.666666 cap hit. Ha ha, they're the devils. It was a long drawn out ridiculous saga. The NHL is like, we're gonna find you a first rounder. And Lou Lamorello goes, yeah, but no you're not. And the NHL goes, you're absolutely right, here it is. Now how could that story possibly get more ridiculous? Kovalchuk retired in 2013. He just walked away from that deal. Three seasons into his $100 million contract, with 12 seasons left on his 15 season contract, Kovalchuk walked away from the New Jersey Devils, walked away from the NHL to go play in the Continental Hockey League. Now, for everyone watching this in disbelief going, how the heck could he do something like that? Listen, here's the difference between us and him. According to capfriendly.com, Ilya Kovalchuk's career earnings in the National Hockey League was about 
million dollars. Another 0.4 million would have been nice. But I tell you what, that 68.6 million dollars that he earned in the NHL does not include the money that he earned in Russia before he was drafted, the money that he earned playing in Russia during the 0405 lockout, he played 11 games during the 0506 season, then during the 2012 13 season, he went back there, and then after walking away from this deal, he played five straight seasons in the KHL for the money rich. SKA St. Petersburg. Plus, he gets to play at home. Ilya Kovalchuk has made enough money over his hockey career that he can make every garment of clothing of his out of money. He could build his house out of money. He could swim in money and even wipe away his tears with money, thinking about the $100 million contract that he walked away from. He has a few money. By the way, that stands for fully unavailable to the Devils. At the beginning of this video, we talked about how the Thrashers or Jets didn't get enough out of this deal. They got five good assets, but they didn't use them properly. What did the Devils get? They got a season's worth of hockey out of NC Salmala. They got over 200 games out of John Merrill. He was a fine defender. And Kovalchuk. The 2011-2012 season, Kovalchuk was fantastic. He was Ilya Kovalchuk as advertised, and in the playoffs, he was even better. They almost won the Stanley Cup, which is the entire point, it's the entire goal. But to only get three seasons out of Kovalchuk, and one of them was a lockout shortened season, and one and a half of those seasons, he wasn't even the Kovalchuk that you thought you were acquiring. Did the Devils really slam dunk that deal? I know, it's unfair. If the Devils win two more games in the 2012 Stanley Cup playoffs, you say, yes, absolutely, they're the Stanley Cup champions. But they didn't, and it's pro sports. It's not meant to be fair. It's a fascinating one. It's one that's up for debate. It's technically at least two trade trees in one. Let me know what you think in the comment box down below. But for now, that is it for this one. Thank you very much for watching. Click like if you liked this video. Click subscribe if you really liked it. Tell all your friends not to walk away from a $100 million contract. Because, I don't know, you ever scored 40 goals in the NHL? No, you haven't. So, take the money.